Hey guys, what's up? It's Eric with Advanced Level Automotive. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to another video. Today, we're taking a look at this 2014 Jeep Compass. It's got the four cylinder 2.4 liter engine. The customer complaint is that the AC is not cooling. Well, what he's telling me is that the AC actually does cool while he's driving, let's say down the freeway, down the highway. But when he's sitting at a standstill or just cruising through a parking lot, uh, the AC does not cool. It just kind of blows lukewarm air. This car actually belongs to a good friend of mine. He just recently got married and he's actually a police officer and he uses this vehicle for a lot of EJs, also known as extra jobs, where outside of his police work, he'll be doing like escorting or patrolling, things like that. So he actually spends a lot of time inside of the vehicle, patrolling parking lots and stuff like that. The heat can be pretty brutal. So he really wants this AC to blow nice and cold like it should be. Anyways, you guys already know how we do it. Let's get started. All right, guys, so the first thing I went ahead and did was I connected the AC manifold gauges. You guys take a look. At the uh, AC lines over here, you can see where the high side and the low side is connected. Now, if we take a look at the gauges, you can see that we're sitting somewhere around 100 PSI on both the low and the high side, equalized pressure. Now, the reason the pressure is equalized is because the engine is not running at the moment, so the compressor is not cycling on and off. We're just looking at static pressure. Now, the reason I wanted to look at static pressure is because I wanted to know whether or not we had sufficient refrigerant in the system for the compressor to even come on. Now, on a normal working system, you should expect to see somewhere between 90 to maybe 110 PSI static resting pressure, but that really depends on the ambient temperature. Right now, it's about 85 degrees. Even though we're inside the garage, we're not in direct sunlight, it's still about 85 degrees in here. So seeing 100 PSI to me seems to be about normal. So I don't think our problem has anything to do with low refrigerant or some type of leak in the system. Because again, looking at this 100 PSI, the system looks like it's pretty full. So the next thing we need to do is we need to hop inside the vehicle, start the engine up, turn the AC on, and take a look at these pressures and see what they tell us. So let's go ahead and hop in. I've got the key in my hand. I'm going to start this thing up. Then we're gonna go ahead and turn the AC on. Make sure it's on all the way to cold. All right, so moving under the hood, before we take a look at the AC gauges, I want to come down here and get a visual on the condenser and the radiator fan. Let me turn on my little flashlight here. You can see the fan is actually spinning. And if we take a look at the other side here, there's two fans on here. This fan is spinning as well. So both of the fans are working at the moment. Let's take a look at our pressures and see what they say. All right, so over here on the low side, we're sitting somewhere about 90 PSI. And then over here on the high side, we're sitting at uh, close to about 150. So immediately what I can tell you right now is that the low side pressure is very high. This low side pressure on a normal operating system that's cooling should be somewhere between 30 and 40 PSI with the ambient temperature we have outside. This is telling me that we don't have enough suction on the suction side of the system. And looking at the high side here, you know, I would expect this to be somewhere somewhere between 250 and 350 on the high side. But if you look, we're not even at 150. To me, it kind of looks like we don't have enough suction. We don't have enough discharge. Now, the next thing I want to do is take a look at the AC compressor pulley because I wonder whether or not this AC clutch is engaging. So if we take a look, I believe the AC compressor is down here at the bottom. So you can see that the belt is on the compressor. And on top of that, this belt looks like it's in really good condition. It's actually brand new. They recently replaced it, but taking a look at the AC compressor down there, it doesn't look like it's slipping. I don't hear any chattering. I don't hear any clutch noises, but if I'm not mistaken, I believe that this compressor does not utilize a traditional clutch and hub like you would find on most old school systems. I believe the compressor on this vehicle actually uses a variable control valve instead of a compressor clutch. So the next thing I wanna do is I wanna get up underneath the vehicle and get a visual and see what the compressor looks like so I can determine what type of style clutch this thing has. All right guys, so I've got the passenger side jacked up. I do have a jack stand underneath and I've got my little work light here. So I'm gonna turn this thing on. We're gonna take a look underneath the vehicle and see what this thing looks like. Uh, I can already see that we do have some type of oil leak on the ground over here. Luckily I have my garage floor coated so I can just wipe that up, no problem. But we'll take a look underneath. Wow. You guys can see we have a pretty major oil leak happening down here. Um, but, you know, that's really not our main concern. 
this vehicle has a lot of issues and uh you know really at this point the owner's just trying to make it last he's not planning on fixing all the problems that this vehicle has because there's just way too many of them but anyway if you look up in here you can see the ac compressor which i can tell right now it's covered in oil so the next thing we need to do is let's go ahead and remove this cover there's a 10 millimeter bolt here you know maybe we don't have to remove the entire cover maybe we can just lower this side oh look that side doesn't even have a bolt in it uh there's a couple clips up here i think so let me go ahead and pop those clips out one two whoa holy moly okay so as soon as i took that clip out this whole thing just fell so anyway you can see this is a pretty major oil leak but if we take a look over here oh we can see the ac compressor and boy this thing is covered in oil and i hope that that oil is not getting onto the belt so let's take a look at the belt here uh the belt looks pretty good so i don't know if that oil is actually making it to the belt and at this point i'm not really sure if the oil is really a problem here um because like i said i don't think this thing utilizes a clutch and hub on the front of the compressor so let's take a look at the front of the compressor here so taking a look at the front of the compressor here you can see uh that this does not have a clutch assembly on the front you know this may look like a clutch plate but it isn't this is just part of the pulley so this is not like a clutch and hub if we take a look on the back side of the compressor here let me see if i can get the light up in there okay so over on the back side of the compressor you can see this little two wire plug that connector is for the ac control valve so take a close look at that you can see that this thing does not utilize a clutch and hub on the front pulley this thing actually utilizes a control solenoid that is installed into the back of the compressor here so this solenoid is actually pretty long it goes into the body of the compressor and that's what actually controls a little swash plate that's inside of the compressor and allows this to vary the amount of ac pressure on the suction and the discharge side of the ac system all right guys so because at the moment i am suspecting that we either have a faulty ac compressor or we have a bad compressor control valve what i want to do is i want to monitor the ac manifold gauges while i raise the rpm so i'm going to go ahead and start this thing up all right let's take a look at the manifold gauges while this thing idles again where we were at before we were sitting somewhere about 90 on the low side and about 150 on the high side so let me take you uh, outside here all right so as you guys can see our pressures are where they were before now what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna raise up the rpm let's raise this thing somewhere to around 3000 3500 rpm and see what the gauges show All right guys, so as you can see, while I had the engine revved up to about 4,000 RPM, we could actually see that on our low side, we got somewhere maybe around 55 PSI, and on the high side, we were somewhere maybe close to 250. Now, that's not nearly where we want it to be. Again, ideally, we want the low side somewhere between 30 and 40. Now, again, like I said, I'm suspecting a faulty AC compressor or a compressor control valve because what I'm thinking is that we don't have enough suction on the suction side of the compressor and we don't have enough discharge on the discharge side of the compressor. Think of it like your heart. Your heart is a pump, just like the AC compressor. The heart sucks blood in one side and it pumps blood out of the other side. So where the heart sucks in blood on the suction side, it discharges blood on the discharge side. The AC compressor is doing the same thing. Now, if you think about it like this, if the AC compressor internals were worn and they could not properly compress the refrigerant, then not only will we not have enough strength to bring the high side pressure up to where it needs to be, we won't have enough strength to bring the suction side down to where it needs to be. Hopefully that makes sense. In this case, like I said, we don't have an AC clutch. We have an AC compressor control solenoid and that solenoid is going to open and close and it's variable. That's the other thing about this is that it doesn't just open and close. 
the computer actually sends a duty cycle signal to control its position to allow it to properly meter the amount of pressure the AC compressor is going to put out. Now just think if that AC compressor control valve was stuck or not opening like it's supposed to, it's not going to allow the compressor to work 100% like it should be. Much in the same way, if you could imagine on an older style compressor that had an old school clutch and hub on the front of the compressor, if that clutch hub was slipping and not fully grabbing onto the clutch, it's not going to allow the compressor to spin like it's supposed to. And in turn, that compressor is not going to provide the correct amount of suction and the correct amount of discharge. Now, the reason raising the RPM helped us to sort of normalize these pressures. Again, we weren't really normalized, but we were able to bring this down somewhere around 55 and bring this up somewhere around 250. And it started to kind of cool off a little bit. You know, it feels kind of cool, but it's not really as cool as it should be. But again, the point that I'm trying to make here is that when we raise the RPM, what we're doing is we're spinning the compressor faster. So that's kind of making up for the fact that the compressor is weak or the compressor control valve is not opening all the way and it's not moving that swash plate to the position where it should be in order for the compressor to work at 100% capacity. But as soon as you let off the accelerator and that compressor starts to slow down and comes back to idle, these pressures go right back to where they were and the AC is not blowing cold. So at this point, it's kind of a toss up between whether or not we have a bad or faulty AC compressor that has worn out internals or whether or not we have a bad control valve solenoid. They're both gonna kind of create the same symptoms that we have here, but there are a couple tests that we could do. We could climb underneath the vehicle, use a multimeter to measure the voltage at the AC control valve and also check the ground. If we find that our powers and grounds are good at the AC control valve, there's a good chance that it could just be a bad control valve. Now, the other reason you might want to replace the control valve versus replacing the entire compressor would be for cost reasons. Like I said, my friend who owns this vehicle, he just got married, spent a lot of money on the wedding. He doesn't have a lot of money to spend on this vehicle. And that's not the only problem this vehicle has. This vehicle has a ton of oil leaks. It's got suspension problems. It's starting to have transmission problems. It's got a check engine light. It's got some lean codes. I mean, this thing has all kinds of issues. It is a Chrysler product, a Jeep product, and you know these things are notorious for having quality issues. So it doesn't make a lot of sense for him to sink a lot of money into trying to fix this thing. At this point, he really just wants to get the AC working because eventually he's going to sell this and try to find something else, maybe something that's a little more reliable. Now I've already looked up the price difference between replacing just the control valve and replacing the whole compressor, it's quite a bit. The control valve itself, we can buy it online, it's about $50. The AC compressor by itself is around $350. So about a $300 difference in just the parts alone, not including labor. And on top of that, if you buy an AC compressor and you wanna get the warranty for it, you can't just buy the compressor, you have to buy the compressor kit. So you're spending about $400 to get the two year warranty on replacing a new compressor. Then on top of that, there's a labor associated with it. Sometimes when we replace just the control valve solenoid, we can get away without having to remove the AC compressor. Sometimes there's enough room for us to just remove it and install the new one. I don't think we have enough room on this one. I might have to look again, but it seems to me like the frame might be in the way. So we might even have to remove the AC compressor either way, whether or not we're replacing the control solenoid or replacing the whole compressor itself. I think this compressor has to come out either way. So we might not be saving a whole lot on labor, but you'll be saving a lot on parts. So anyway, let's move under the vehicle and do our quick check. So moving back underneath the vehicle, you guys can see I have my lab scope over here. Let me show you where I have it connected. As you guys can see, I'm back broke on the white wire. That is going to be our power wire and the red wire is going to be our ground wire. So let me take you guys over to the lab scope and show you what we got. All right guys, so taking a look at the lab scope here, you can see that we have a nice duty cycle signal control from the engine computer. You can see that we have about 12 volts here. You can see it's kind of turning it all the way on, 12 volts, and then it's kind of cycling it, pulsing it, and then having it on. So this right here, I believe is 100%. And then this is kind of variable right here. So it seems like it's trying to get this thing to work. But like I said, this valve is probably either stuck or it's not opening all the way. But what I can tell you is that we do have full battery voltage getting to this AC control valve. So this is not a power input problem. All right guys, so now I'm back probe 
on our red wire. And like I said, our red wire is going to be our ground wire. So let's take a look at the meter here. So taking a look at the meter, you can see that we have about 0.17 volts, which is about 170 millivolts which is normal for the ground side on this circuit. Now, one more thing we could do while we're at it is load test the ground. What I'm gonna be using is this incandescent uh, test light. And so what I'm going to do is disconnect my yellow lead, which is connected to the back probe on the back of the uh, control valve. And then I'm going to take my test light, which is connected directly to the battery positive up here. You can see I have these cables, the leads, they go to the positive battery terminal. And so, this tip right here of the incandescent test light is connected directly to battery positive. Now I'm going to touch it to the yellow here, again, which is attached to our back probe, which is back probed into the ground wire. So I'm going to touch it. And as long as we have a good ground, this test light should light nice and bright. You guys can see we do have a good ground. All right, guys, so at this point, I feel pretty confident calling this a bad AC control valve or solenoid. Now, am I 100% sure? No, I can't be. And the reason is because, like I said, we could still have a faulty AC compressor that has worn out internals, and that's going to cause the same symptoms that we see right now. The only reason I'm going to replace the AC control valve instead of replacing the AC compressor is because this is a good friend of mine. He doesn't have a whole lot of money right now. This vehicle isn't worth putting that much money into, so hopefully, putting a $50 part in it is going to fix the problem. Now, I probably wouldn't do this if this was a normal, regular customer because, you know, there's some liability tied to it. What if you replace the AC control valve, it doesn't fix the problem, and then the customer expects you to go back in there and do it again for free. So, like I said, this, if you wanna do it on your own vehicle, that's a good idea. If you wanna do it on a buddy's vehicle, that's a good idea. But a customer who's paying you and expects some type of warranty from you, I wouldn't suggest it. And like I said, I took a closer look at this AC control valve and I do have to drop the AC compressor in order to replace it. Like I said, on some vehicles, it's positioned in a way where you can actually just remove it without having to remove the AC compressor. But in this case, it's pointed straight toward the frame and there's only about probably two inches between that valve and the frame. There's not gonna be enough room for me to slide that valve out. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and order the valve the only place we could get it was online. Nobody had it locally, so it's gonna be a few days before it gets here. Hopefully they send us the right one. We don't have to go back and forth trying to find the correct one. That's the other problem with trying to locate these valves is that they can be tricky to find. And at this point, I don't wanna pull the valve out because I have to pull the whole compressor out, you know, because the guy actually wants to drive the truck in the meantime. And if I pull the valve out to match it up, then the truck's gonna be sitting until I get the new one. Uh, so I can put it back in. So I, I don't have the option of pulling it out to try to match it up. I'm just going by the applications that I find online. I found one on eBay for about 50 bucks. I'm gonna order it. Hopefully when it comes in, it's gonna be the right one. We'll see what happens. I'll see you guys in a few days. Run week later. All right guys, so fast forward. It's now been about a week since we last had the truck here in the garage. And this just came in the mail yesterday. This is our brand new compressor clutch solenoid or control valve, whatever it is you wanna call it. Um, like I said, I'm really hoping that this is going to be the correct part because a lot of the listings that I found online were kind of vague. Uh, so it was kind of hard to determine whether or not this one was actually going to fit this particular vehicle. The only way for us to find out is to actually remove the compressor from the truck. So let's not waste any time. Let's get started. All right, guys, so I've got the tire off on the passenger side here. I also went ahead and I removed the bottom plastic cover. Uh, so that we can get a good view of the AC compressor right there. I also went ahead and I removed the serpentine belt. Right now what I'm doing is I'm actually uh, spraying down the AC compressor with some brake clean. Because if you guys remember, this compressor was really, really dirty. It was covered in oil. Let me take you down there and show you. Yeah, so there's our AC compressor. You can see it's covered in oil. I've already started uh, dousing it with some brake clean. But uh, let me show you how dirty this thing is. I'm going to spray it. You can see all that oil coming off. Make sure you do this in a well-ventilated area because this stuff is strong. Wow. Alright guys, so now that I've got this compressor cleaned off, 
I think what I want to try to do is rather than completely removing the compressor, I think I'm going to try to just go ahead and remove the three mounting bolts. So there's one bolt down here. I know it's kind of difficult to see. The other one is over here on the back side. Let's see if you guys can see that right there. And then there's another one up here on that side at the top. And if you look right here, this is where our control valve is located. And again, like I said, you know, if this was pointing down here, then we wouldn't have to worry about removing the compressor at all. We could probably just slide it out from down here. But because of where it's located, you can see that um, even if I were to remove this valve uh, and pull it back, it's just going to hit the frame. So there's not enough room for us to pull this valve out. So what we want to try to do here is uh, remove these compressor bolts and kind of tilt the compressor downward so that we can slide this valve out. Hopefully that'll work. And if it does, it's definitely gonna save us a lot of time. All right guys, as you can see, I went ahead and removed the three mounting bolts for the AC compressor. That allowed the compressor to hang. And if you look right here, you can see we just cleared the frame. So we have plenty of room to get this valve out. Like I said, I did not disconnect the lines, but I don't know if I mentioned this, I did have the system fully recovered. That's really important before you try to remove this valve is that you need to take this to a local shop. If you don't have the means to recover the system, uh, take it to your local shop and they can recover the system for you. So like I said, there's no refrigerant in here right now. So I should be able to pull this valve out without any trouble. Uh, but before we do that, I'm gonna hit this thing with some compressed air to clean up the inside right here. Then we can disconnect this connector and remove the snap ring. Now we're gonna disconnect the connector like that. Now we can remove the snap ring that's in there just using a pair of snap ring pliers. Come on, get out of there. There we go. Whew, that was definitely harder than I thought it was gonna be. All right, so now our valve looks like it's about ready to come out. I don't know if we can just pull it out with our fingers. I didn't think so. We might have to take a screwdriver and pry it up or maybe some pliers and pull it out. Just gonna use a tiny pry bar. See if I can pop this thing out. Just kind of be gentle with it. Work it back and forth. Try not to break the plastic. Kind of switch sides here. You try and grab it with some pliers. See if I can twist this thing out of here. Put some muscle into it. There we go. Oh no, guys. This does not look like the one we ordered. This is completely different. All right, so take a close look at this valve that I just pulled out of there. You can see where the connector goes up here at the top. And this slides into the compressor. And if you look inside of the compressor, you can see that um, it's basically just sort of this uh, pin right here. And this actually has a little tab on the side of it. Let me see right there. So if you look at that tab, um, there's actually a little indentation or a slot in the wall where uh, when you put it in, it looks like you just turn it clockwise to lock it into place. But uh, this is completely different from the one that we ordered. Uh, this looks like it's just some kind of magnet. All right, guys, so comparing the one that I pulled off of the vehicle right here uh, to the one that we ordered online, I'm starting to think that, uh, you know, maybe we only pulled half of the valve out. I guess when I went to twist this, I must have twisted um, this little tab here away from the outer shell which is part of this whole aluminum housing here. So maybe this plastic part at the top is just the magnet. And all we did was separate the magnet from the rest of it. So I think I'm gonna try to stick this back in there, um, clip it in place, and then pull the whole thing out. Hopefully that's gonna work. All right guys, so I managed to get the rest of the valve out of the compressor. It's over here on the right-hand side. Now, before I get to the obvious, um, I wanted to explain to you guys uh, how I got the rest of this valve out. So if you guys remember when I first pulled this out, this piece came out by itself and that's because I turned it and unlocked it from this uh, sleeve here and pulled just the magnet out. Now I tried to slip this back in there and uh, clamp it back down like that and pull on just the connector. Um, but this thing was really stuck in there. It would not come out. And all that happened was that I ended up kind of damaging the connector. So what I had to do was just remove this whole magnet piece, take a pair of pliers. Um, now the pliers that I had to use were these right here that I got from Snap-on. And they're kind of a strange plier. I don't know how to explain this, but 
you know, in this case, they worked really well for me to come in here and just grab a good bite on that sleeve and pull on it because I tried to do it with like needle nose pliers and various other pliers, but you know, this thing was really stuck in there and this one was the only one that would give it enough grip so that I could pull this thing out. So anyways, when I pulled this thing out, you know, I was obviously pretty disappointed at the fact that, well, it was obviously not the same as the one that we ordered from eBay. This one here is the one I ordered online. As you guys can see, it is way longer than the one I pulled out of this compressor. So this is obviously not going to work. Um, at this point, I really have no choice but to go ahead and replace the entire compressor. You guys can see I already removed the compressor from the vehicle and I went ahead and I got a new compressor over here. So we are going to be replacing the old one with the new one. And the reason behind that is because, well, I've already exhausted all of my sources and I cannot find anyone who has this thing in stock. And the customer just cannot wait another week for us to order one off of eBay. And the other reason being is because we already had this all apart and it would be a lot of extra work for us to put everything back together so that we can order the part, wait a week, and then take it all back apart so that we can replace just this valve. And again, like I said, guys, I can't even be 100% sure whether or not replacing just this valve is going to fix the issue. I was really just trying to save my friend some money because this compressor was not cheap. My cost on this compressor was about $416. So we were both hoping that this was going to solve our problem. But like I said, at this point, we really don't have a choice. All right, guys, so fast forward. I've got the AC compressor installed. You can see I have the manifold gauges connected. I'm getting ready to charge up the system. I did pull a vacuum on it with my vacuum pump. Now replacing the compressor was not difficult at all. It really just requires the removal of the passenger side tire. Once you get that tire out of the way, you have plenty of room down here to get to the compressor bolts and remove that compressor from the bottom. Uh, one of the bolts you do have to remove from the top, which is the bolt for the line, but the rest of them can be taken out from the bottom. Anyway, while I had the truck here, I did notice that it had a coolant leak and the leak was coming from the radiator, which is something that I really couldn't ignore because, uh, you know, I didn't want this thing to overheat and blow up the engine. Uh, so I went ahead and replaced the radiator. You can see we have a brand new one. Uh, so that's why we have this funnel connected. I'm getting ready to start this thing up and bleed the cooling system. And while we're bleeding it, we're going to be charging it up with refrigerant. And so once we get this thing up and running, get the refrigerant topped off and we'll check the gauges. All right, guys, so we've got the coolant system bled out. I went ahead and I topped off the refrigerant. Take a look at the gauges. Right now the engine is running. And if you look at our low side, we're sitting somewhere around 32, maybe 31 PSI. And over on the high side, you can see that we're somewhere around 175. Right now, the ambient temperature outside is about 82 degrees. So this is exactly what I wanna see. This is telling me that our AC compressor is working because we have suction on the low side and we have discharge on the high side. So far, everything looks good. Now, if I take you guys inside of the vehicle, I can show you that the AC is blowing nice and cold. You can feel it out of the vents, perfect. Taking a look at the uh, thermostat over here, you can see that we're blowing somewhere around 55, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So that is definitely a fix. Now, one thing I would like to add is that earlier when I first charged up the system and I had the vehicle running, I went ahead and I set this dial over here all the way to the cold position, which is all the way to the blue. And I shut these doors and I let it run so that it could cool down in here. But in fact, when I came back about 10 minutes later, I opened this door and it was really, really hot inside. And so this kind of made sense because a few days ago, the owner actually called me and told me that uh, the AC was no longer blowing cold at all. It just felt hot. I didn't think much of it. You know, to me, it made sense that the compressor was, you know, an issue and maybe it just had finally gone out. But when I felt it for myself, I was able to tell right away that it had something to do with the blend door actuator and this thing was stuck in a heater mode. And so I went underneath the dash right here and I'll show you a little video of it, but there's the actuator for the blend door and there's a little arm attached to uh, some linkage that kind of moves up and down. And that's what actually closes and opens the blend door. Well, that linkage, the arm was getting hung up. And so what I had to do was uh, spray it with some lithium grease, uh, clean it down, unjam it and make sure that it moved back and forth freely. After I did that, I was able to get the door all the way to the cold position 
And then of course, you know, I played with the knob, move it over to the hot position, move it over to the cold position, make sure that it's able to switch back and forth freely. So at this point, I don't think it needs a blend or actuator. I think the linkage was just probably dirty or dried up. And so it needed to be re-lubricated. I just wanted to throw that in there for any of you guys who might be dealing with the same issue. Maybe at some point in time, you go in there and turn this knob to the hot position. And then, you know, when you want to turn it back to the cold position, it doesn't go all the way to the cold position. It's stuck somewhere in between. If that's happening to you guys, take a quick minute to crawl up underneath the dash. Like I said, it's located right up there. I mean, you kind of have to uh, uh, bend over backwards to look up, but you'll see it up against the center of the dash over there. Anyways, guys, at this point, I'm gonna end off the video. I'm hoping maybe you took something away from it uh, because quite honestly, I'm not even sure if I'm going to post this video because a lot of things really didn't go as planned, uh, which now that I'm thinking about it, might be a good reason to post this video because it shows you that in real life, not everything is gonna go as planned. You know, I started out by trying to save my friend some money by just replacing the valve on the compressor, but you know, we had a whole dilemma with wrong parts, so that didn't work out. We ended up having to buy the whole compressor anyway. Um, we also had to replace the radiator. I mean, it did give me a chance to kind of go over his truck and create a list of items that need to be fixed or replaced. You know, in this case, you guys saw that he had a whole lot of oil leaks going on. All of that needs to get taken care of. We had some other issues uh, dealing with the check engine light, which you might see it on another video. Uh, but yeah, this thing has kind of a multitude of problems, which is one of the reasons I really don't recommend anyone to buy any of these Jeep Chrysler products because they are not very reliable. They don't last very long. They tend to have a lot of issues. And on top of the laundry list of things that need to be repaired on this truck, uh, the transmission is starting to shift really funny. I smell the fluid and it really smells kind of burned. So I'm worried about how much longer the transmission is going to last in this thing. Anyway, like I always say, I hope you found the video useful, informational, educational, entertaining. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up. If you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks.